worship. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. Moreover, I'm reading this out of King Jimmy tonight. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Dropping down, if you would, to verse number 23 of the same chapter. This is David now responding to this word that the Lord has been giving him through Nathan the prophet. And as he's thinking about what it is that God is saying, what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself and to make him a name and to do for you great things and terrible. For the land before thy people is thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. You have confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. Would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name, amen. And I want, I want you tonight to see some of the incredible blessings and benefits the Lord wants you to experience as his people. I also want you to see the incredible promises and benefits he made available to the people of the past. I want you to see the incredible opportunities of partnering with God in the greatest adventure of all time. We will see those who had been given by God such an opportunity to become partners with God in an incredible adventure. And some of them blew it. Some of them lost. They missed their opportunity. More importantly, we will see how we have the opportunity to step into the same privileges and responsibilities. It's, it's a part of the opportunity of being the people of God. But yeah, well, this message first came to pass. We've been asked, I've been asked to speak at what was called the rebranding of a church. Church had gone through an intense time of self-inspection and self-evaluation. And, and they kind of closed down the old and started up the new, you know, same building, but name change and refocus and, you know, new leadership. And just had gone through a time of saying, we just need to be reevaluating. What is it that God's called us to do? Who are we? What is our direction? And so they asked me to come and be a part of, of a process of a few weeks uh, of, of, of the launching of that and then they said and when you come we want you to preach on this subject now I don't do well when they say to me would you preach on this subject you know I, I try my best but almost every time I'm given one of those assignments I manage to say something that gets me in hot water you know, I'm, I'm trying my best you know just to but I, I man so I was a little concerned and they said, well, what you want to preach on is the phrase, to be a people. And I thought, what? You want me to preach on them? And so I, I just pulled up my Bible concordance and computer, and I punched in the phrase, to be a people. And I was amazed at what I found and continue to find. Because I became aware that God had allowed me, from my perspective, to stumble onto one of the core truths of Scripture. That from the beginning of time, God has been looking, not only individually, but corporately as well, for those He could identify as my people. And we will see that in the, in the process of that, uh, that there are blessings and benefits that God wants to pour out. But there are also opportunities. 
You see, from the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he was looking for someone he could come into a unique relationship with. It's always a part of what God has wanted to do. Now, God had arranged, and I'm going to kind of take a leap into a bit of biblical history. God had arranged to provide for Jacob and his family during a time of drought by sending them to Egypt. God had placed Joseph, a son of Jacob, into a key political position in Egypt. But with the passage of time, Joseph dies, as did the political leadership that had promoted him. New dictatorial leaders uh, were uh, afraid of the descendants of Jacob. And they placed this family into slavery. For 400 years, the situation remained. You know, there are some things, you, you read them and it doesn't really hit you. Friend, that's longer, you know, from the time that the pilgrims first stumbled onto you know, the East Coast of the U.S. For over 400 years, these friends had been, had been slaves in Egypt. And for 400 years, they have cried out to God for His intervention. And there were those who had lived and died. And it appeared that God had not responded. But you see, God not only deals with us as individuals, God also deals with us as corporate groups. And one of the things we need to understand that God can use a person. He can deal with your family unit as a family unit. He can deal with the church as a church unit. He can deal with the city as a city unit. He can deal with the nation as a national unit. And you can be affected by what God is doing in any one or several of those dimensions at the same time. And so God was dealing with a corporate unit. For 400 years they have cried out to God. And God does hear their cry. And God raises up a man by the name of Moses. Who becomes their deliverer. Now when Moses leads the descendants of Jacob out of Egypt. God did something that had never been done before. He took a ragtag group of people who had been slaves for their entire existence and formed them into a nation. Now understand, this group had no culture of their own. They were property. They had no identity of their own. They were just simply the property of someone else. They had no idea how to function as a nation. No idea how to function as a group of individuals. They were not accustomed to giving orders. They were accustomed to receiving orders. They had no idea how it was that they could become what God wanted them to become. And so God does something that has never taken place in history. He delivers an entire group of individuals. They who are not a people. But now they will become a people. Had no identity. But now God says, you will become my people. Now surely after crossing the Red Sea. And what a miracle God did. In causing the sea to open up. uh, So they could walk across on dry ground. And for the skeptics. I love the story of the professor who said to his students, you understand that wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea, and only has an inch or two of water in it, and so it wasn't a big deal. And the student went, wow, wow, incredible. And the prophet said, well, what's so incredible? He said, God drowned the whole Egyptian army in an inch of water. This group came to Mount Sinai. Awesome things happened to Mount Sinai. 
In fact, the rest of the scripture is constantly referring to what happened at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God says this in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites in IV. The phrase treasured possession comes from a word meaning to shut up, not as in something you tell your children. But as in something you put into a safe or a secret place where it's protected and nobody knows it's there or nobody can get to it. Like something you would place a a jewel or a diamond inside of. That's the idea behind the word. So what God is saying this, I'm going to make you to be like a jewel to me. You are my diamond. May I say to you that God wants to make you a jewel. He views you as a jewel. He wants you to understand how strongly He feels about you. You are a treasured possession. In fact, I want you to help me. I want you to look at the person next to you. And would you say to them, you are a treasure to God. You are a treasured possession to God. Now I want you to do something else. I'm only going to give you 15 seconds to do this. Because some of you get carried away. Otherwise, we'll be here the rest of the night. I want you just to lay your hand on their shoulder and bless them. In the name of Jesus. As a treasured possession. Treasured by God and treasured by you. Just bless them. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you for you are a treasure to God and you are a treasure to me. And I bless you because you are a treasured possession. That's enough. I'll get a big head. Some of you need to speak that into their lives on a regular basis. That they're a treasure. And then God says this incredible statement to them. I am going to make you a kingdom of priests. And I'm going to make you a holy nation. As priests, they would be allowed to stand between God and other people. Now you see, I'm Pentecostal. I'm assemblies of God. We don't do priests. We don't understand priests. You know, we're just, we're not connected that way. And yet God said, I am going to make you a priest. So I said, well, what do priests do? And what priests did was they connected people to God and connected God to people. They stood between the people and God. They brought God's word to the people and they brought the needs of the people To God. They were evangelists and they were intercessors. You see, priests evangelize, Uh, priests are teachers. Uh, They bring God's message, Uh, they bring God's word. Uh, They bring what it is that God wants to say to people who maybe do not even know God. Uh, And then they bring the needs of those people to before God so that God can be made aware of those needs. And God says to this former group of slaves, you are going to be a kingdom of priests. And then he says, you're going to be a holy nation. As a holy nation, he wanted to use them as a pattern, an example of what God could do. He wanted his presence To so shine in them that others would be attracted. It's interesting that they were identified, in fact, as the people of the presence. 
the cloud that went before them by day and the pillar of fire by night, uh, the visible manifestation, the expression of the presence and the glory of God that always abided with them. Unique, distinctive. No one else had that encounter and experience. Uh, but what God wanted was that this people be a pattern, an example, that others could see what would happen uh, when God's presence would come into their midst. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But let me make this part of the message personal. And especially for those who perhaps you're not in a right relationship with Jesus tonight. For those who love typology, and that's not my strong point, but Egypt often has been used to represent sin. And God wants to speak to you about sin because he does not want you to live under the authority of sin. He does not want you to live under the control of sin. And I use those words deliberately. Then there's the guy that, you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm a self-made man. I've been tempted to tell a few of those guys, you need to have your construction permit revoked. Because you're not doing such a good job. God, I use the word control because you need to understand that God does not want your life to be lived. Because you see, those some people say, well, you know, I do what I want to do. But often the truth is this. They do what sin tells them to do. Well, I do what I want to do. It's, it's like, and, and forgive me if this is, a, you know, is, a, is, is too confrontive or front of. I, I apologize in advance for it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's, it's the kid who starts smoking at 14 to prove he's a man. And at 54, he's trying to quit to prove the same thing. And the issue comes in that, but I do what I want. No, sir, you are doing what that thing wants you to do. And so much of sin is that way. It takes control of somebody's life. And God does not want you to live under the control of sin. Whether that sin is your temper, whether that sin is your stinginess, whether that sin is greed, whether that sin is pornography, God does not want you to live under the control of sin. He wants you to be set free from sin. He wants to set you free that He can do something. Because He wants you to understand, first of all, He sees you as valuable. You are a treasure to Him. He absolutely loves you. And he takes a look at what sin is doing in your life. And he says, I've got a better plan for you than that. You see, when God sees what sin does to people, it grieves the heart of God. Because he knows what sin can do and he sees what sin is doing. And he knows that his plan for you is so much better. He wants you free from that. I said it last night at the altar, and I'm sure there were many who missed it in in the whole context of what's happening. But I've observed over the years when people come to Jesus, I've never yet, in all of these years, I've never had a person say to me when they gave their life to Jesus, boy, I sure wish I would have waited and done this later. I sure wish I'd have just put this off even longer. But I I cannot count the number of people who have said to me, why did I wait so long? If I really would have under... He's not against you, friend. He has this incredible plan for you. You're a treasure to Him. He wants to make you totally clean. A holy. And there's nothing in the world like standing before God clean. He wants to make you someone who can bless others. In Exodus 19, though, there were requirements for this. They were to obey me fully. Keep my covenant. Obedience to the word of God is required. 
God wants to make you His people. If you will turn, if you'll obey to Him, obey the call to turn away from sin and to turn to Him, that you will commit to keeping His Word, then He will come and live inside of you. And I want to give you the opportunity tonight of experiencing that. You can become a man or woman of God. And I do not understand how this happens, but God Himself will come and live inside of you how in the world God inhabits the universe at the same time lives inside of a person is way beyond my pay grade you know I I cannot figure that one out it's somebody smarter than me and with more responsibility than me is going to have to figure that one out I just simply accept it and so God says to Moses I want to have a people that are my people who are my treasured possession, so that I can make them to be a priest nation, that they will carry my word to others, and they will bring the needs of others to me, a people that will be a holy people, upon whom I can put my presence. Now we come to our text, where God is confirming Israel to be His people forever to David. It's the same message he gave to Moses. And now he's saying to David, uh, I'm going to do this for you. Now you see the background is this. David has proposed uh, to build a temple for God. He wants something more than a tent for the ark to be in. But God would not permit David to build the temple. It would be reserved for his son Solomon to do. But God responds to what was in the heart of David by promising to build a house for David that will last forever. And we understand that the ultimate ultimate fulfillment of this promise was the birth of Jesus the Savior of the world as a descendant of David and his house will last forever and of his kingdom there will be no end and tucked into the promise to David are these three verses we've read tonight the promise of the word of God to the nation a promise to be a people Walk with me to the verses quickly. Verse 10 is a prophetic word to David. The promise is wonderful, but for the sake of time, I'm I'm not going to go there tonight. But David hears this entire incredible prophetic word, what God's going to do. And in verse 23, David's responding to it. He's blown away. He's absolutely blown away. He says, what other nation is like this nation? He said, nobody else has ever received such A promise. A nation God wants to redeem for himself. God personally redeemed them. Can I say that again? God personally redeems you. He didn't send an angel. He sent a son. He sent a member of the family. You know, one of the incredible mysteries of God's word, you know, you know, there's hero is that the Lord thy God is one God. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit again. I don't understand all of that, but I know this, He sent Himself. There's a sense He sent Himself. He said, I'm sending my Son. I will personally redeem you. Wow. He didn't say, hey, Gabe, come here. <laughs> you know, I'm going to send you down there. No. I'm sending my best. A people God wanted to use to make a name for himself. That God wanted to bring glory to himself by what he would do in Israel. Now let me give you an application. God wants to bring glory to himself. Not only by what he does in your life individually but by what he does in your life corporately. What God does in the life of a congregation in a city, 
what God does in the life of the church of the city to bring glory to His name. As these people would be the people of God, God would do the types of things in them that would cause others to reverence God and to experience the fear of God. Now you see this as well in the book of Acts chapter 5 where the things that God did caused great fear to come upon those both inside and outside the church. As a result, Acts 5.14, multitudes were added to the church. The body of Christ is exploding in growth. Why? Because of the types of things that, that God did. As he presenced himself in that church. Now God had redeemed them. Not only from Egypt, but had driven out, 1 Chronicles 17, 21, the nations. That is, God had given them military victory over those people who had formerly lived in the land. He deeded the land to Israel. And now God's confirming his promise. He's going to make it stand. He's confirmed Israel to be a people, and He's confirmed He will be their God. Application. He wants to establish you. Part of the church in the city. To plant you. Give you a place. Give you victory over the devil. To do great things in you and through you. He wants to do signs and wonders. That will bring great glory to His name. To do the things that cause others to fear and to come into relationship with Him. One of my favorite stories of the zillions of stories God has blessed me with. I wasn't in the meetings, but a friend of mine was pastoring a church in Arkansas where God had just did one of those God things. And, um, and one night, he, he told this story, that one night a, a guy came into the parking lot, Mafia Connections. So you got to figure it out, he's a bad guy. Okay. And, and, and he, comes into the, he comes into the church. They're in revival, God's moving. I mean, I could tell you stories this guy told me that would curl your hair, you know, if it's straight and straighten it if it's curly. Just that sort of God stuff. But he says this night, this mafia guy walks into the building. He gets inside the building, experiences the presence of God. He turns and he runs for his pickup. Jumps in the pickup, squeals out of the parking lot, but it's too late. He's already been close enough that God sunk the hook into him. He spends the next 24 hours in frustration, finds himself irresistibly drawn to the same place the next night. He walks through that same outside door, and this time the Spirit of God ups it a little bit. The dude steps in, and God decks him. Okay? You know, I I know some people say, well, God would never do that. Ask Saul of Tarsus. And it wasn't even polite. You know, I shouldn't say this, but because this is something we all say. I've said it, but we are wrong. We say God is a perfect gentleman. Not always. He did not ask Saul of Tarsus for permission. He just simply grabs him and drags him off of his animal and throws him on the ground. If you need understanding of that, it means you're driving down 41 outside of here within the speed limit. And God opens the door of your car and grabs you, hauls you out, and throws you in the ditch. That's what God did to Saul of Tarsus. Well, that's basically what God did to this mafia guy. He steps in the building and God decks him. He crawls. This is before service has begun. He crawls from the foyer through the swinging doors down to the altar to give his life to Jesus before church begins. You know, I love what God does. You know, I just love when God, when God turns up, I, you know, the signs and the wonders, the, the fear of God that came into that dude. I want you to get a glimpse of the magnitude. I'm, I'm, I'm kneeling here and laying here on the floor during worship and Man, it's just, you know, I don't know what's going on where you're at. Where I was at, it was pretty intense. 
And I kept hearing this in my heart. I know it was God or me or something. I just kept hearing this. The, the magnitude of the plan. The magnitude of God's plan. Listen, friend. God doesn't make any little plans. Now, He covers all the little details. You know, He's not like some people who have big pictures and no idea how they're going to get there. You know, God has big plans and He knows how to connect the dots too. But he has these huge plans. I keep hearing this thing of the magnitude of what God wants to do. And I want you to get a glimpse of the magnitude of God's plan for you individually and corporately. He wants to redeem you. To ransom you back from Satan's control. To set you free from sin. He wants to establish you in a place that is your own. He wants to be your God. And you to be His people. A people in whom He can reveal His presence. That will bring glory and honor to Him. That the revelation of His presence with signs and wonders in this incredible sense that God is on that campus. Cause others say, I've got to get to know that God. And I'm going to ask you tonight to commit yourself to becoming a part of such a journey. That would be fun to close right here. Shout of victory, great anticipation, magnitude of a plan. It's awesome. I could just tell more stories. It'll be wonderful. But a day came when God withdrew his offer. Now, there's some parts of God's Word that, you know, I just don't really like as much. They bother me. Somebody asked one guy once, you know, they said, you know, those things in God's Word that I don't understand, because they cause problems for me. Somebody else said, that's not what causes problems for me. He said, my problem is the parts I do understand. He said, he said, that's my problem. It's, it's not the parts I don't, it's the parts I do, because i got to do something about that. A day came when God withdrew his offer. It's possible for us to miss what God wants to do. The evangelist of international reputation was talking to God one day about revival, and God said to him, do you know how many revivals I start every year? I love the line, and I stole it from somebody. If you steal from one, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. <laughs> so I, I just steal from as many as I can, man. When God asks you a question, He is not looking for information. Can I say that again? When God asks you a question, He is not looking for information. It's not like God was saying, can you tell me how many revivals get started? Because I've lost track. No, there was a message there that it was, the problem wasn't God coming. The problem was things on our part. That was often keeping God from finalizing the types of things he was wanting to do, and he began to breathe by his spirit onto a place. God's people missed his purposes for them. Hosea chapter 1 tells the story. Instead of being a holy, set-aside people, they began to live in sin and conduct themselves like the nations around them. Instead of influencing, they became the influenced. Instead of becoming the people of His presence, they just wanted to be like the other nations. They grew weary with being the unique people of God. You hear it in statements like this when they say to Samuel, We want a king. Like all the other nations. God had been their king. We don't want God to be our king. 
Well, we're tired of prophets. Can we, can we get a king like everybody else? Uh, we're tired of this pressure. We're tired of carrying the presence of God. We're tired of the reputation. It's a place my wife and I were speaking a few years back, and God, God graced it. In fact, I won't tell you where, but I'll tell you, for those with memories like elephants, when we were here 13 years ago, and we knew that we had come to that point that, that our, our part here, our assignment here was, was, was over. That with, uh, I got a phone call from this next place I'm going to be at. And this guy says, man, because something happened at our church Sunday. He goes, and, and well, in fact, I said to him, I said, you know, I, th- I think we're done in Terre Haute. I said, I think we can come or I can wait and go someplace else first. If you do. He said, oh, no, man. He said, something happened last week. He said, I don't know what to do with it. You've got to come. You've got to come now. And in the next few weeks in that church, we saw something like 350 people commit their lives to Jesus and the presence of God that came incredible in that place. And I mean, I mean, there was just, there was stuff, there was stories. My mother was up there in those meetings that part of it. She said, I think of all of the meetings that I've gone to that you're preaching. She said, this is probably the strongest thing I've sensed. It was just, and in the middle of that, one of the, one of the, I can work this carefully. One of the pillars of the church found a journal dating from the beginnings of the church. And she had said to her pastor, Pastor, you got to find this. you got to read this. This is the journal. I was in my attic cleaning out this, this thing. I came across my parents' journal. It was their journal of prayer meetings right at the turn of the 1900s. We're talking before the assemblies of God came into existence. We're talking at the time of Azusa Street. We're talking in that season of time. And the hungry people in that area were crying out to God. And God had responded. And the pastor went and picked up the journal. And he's reading. He says, Michael, he goes, you ought to see this thing. He said, it reads like what we've been watching the last few weeks. He said, this is incredible. He said, what I'm reading. He said, it's awesome. He said, this lady, oh, sis, you must let me take this to the pulpit. Let me read this to the church. It will give them understanding of who we are and where our background is and what God has done. And she says, no way. She said, it took us 30 years to live down that reputation. We don't want it again. We're tired of carrying the presence of God. Can we just have church like everybody else? Get me out of here on time so I can beat somebody to Bonanza. They grew weary. They failed to be a people of missions who would represent God to the nations. You see, they missed the very fact that when God said to them, to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And your offspring. Why? So that you will be a blessing. Isn't it interesting that when you go to the New Testament, you remember where Jesus, you know, cleaned, cleansed the courtyard? You know, you know what the name of that courtyard was? The courtyard of the Gentiles. It was the place where as close as the Gentiles could get to the presence of God. And when they came in to as close as they could get to the presence of God, the people of God ripped them off. In fact, they said things like this, you can't come in here. Of course, we would never do anything like that. If you're going to come to our church, you've got to look like this. Hello? Hello? You got to dress this way. You got to have this sort of appearance about you. You have to conduct yourself this way. I'll just kind of leave that right there. Moving right along while I still got friends. They became exclusive. God had blessed them and nobody else. And by the time of the ministry of Hosea, the state reached had brought God to a point of withdrawing His offer. 
The lesson is found in the life of Hosea, Hosea 1 and 2. Hosea is commanded to take to himself an adulterous wife. She became the living illustration of God's people who had committed idolatry or spiritual adultery. The woman bears three children. Some may not have been fathered by Hosea, whose names tell the story. Hosea's first son was named Jezreel, meaning God sows or God will scatter, which spoke of the dispersion or the scattering of the people into the nations. Catch the message. At Egypt, God brought them out of the nation and made a people of those who had not been a people. Those who had never been a people, he's made them a people. Now he is saying he would end their existence as a people. The unique relationship with God as his people could be brought to an end. Friend, pick up the, understand what God is saying. If you go off into sin, you remove yourself from the umbrella of God's promises. They were God's people. And they chose to disobey God. They chose with understanding. I was struck with this today, pastors. I was reading God's word as God is pleading with his people. And he talks about the covenant that he had made with them. A covenant required agreement on both sides. There's no contract with only one party. If there's a contract, both sides have committed to something. And so when these people of God walked into sin, they understood the contract. They had made an agreement with God. They had made an agreement for themselves and for their descendants and those who had come after them. And as their descendants were being raised up, they were hearing of the contract. They understood the relationship and what God expected. And they knowingly chose to disobey. And it's not that God is in the same You know, I just don't like you, so I think I'm just going to. God delays and delays and delays. Because in that promise, in that covenant, they'd already spelled out the consequences for all actions. And God delays as long as he possibly can. So he can delay no longer. And mercy has finally reached the point that justice demands To step in. And God reluctantly allows it to take place in the life of his people. If you go off into sin, you remove yourself from God's umbrella of promise. Hosea's daughter was named Loruhama, means this, no more mercy. These are the people God had favored. But now he is saying, no more mercy. Now mercy would be shown to the house of Judah, the descendants of David. There would always be somebody, a remnant that would be there because of the mercy. But the house of Israel would not be shown mercy. Literally, this happened. As the ten tribes went into Assyrian captivity, they were never restored. And the descendants of those ten tribes were never able to trace their lineage. The mercy of God had been withdrawn from them. It is possible to resist God's mercy until it is withdrawn. I beg you not to do that. Now, there be individuals who would receive and experience the mercy of God, but they no longer receive His mercy as a unit. So individual Israelites would experience God's mercy in their lives. But they would never exist as a unit any longer. And there are churches who, because of decisions and choices they make, remove themselves from God's intended purpose and plan for their lives. Never again to see it fulfilled. God continues to show mercy to individuals. People who are part of that uh, may continue to experience God's blessing upon them life personally. But as a unit, God says, no more. It's over. 
Hosea's last son was named Loami, meaning literally, not my people. The name of the third child completes the tragic downward spiral. God says to them, you are not my people and I am not your God. No more intimacy. No more relationship with him. Now understand, religious activity would continue. But the presence and the favor of God would be withdrawn. And tragically, it's the ongoing saga of much of Christianity. Movements who have known the incredible intimate presence and power of God. I have Emmanuel back in the table said what hap- called what happens during revival. And I've traced some of the stuff that God does and, and, and not, not only biblically to give a biblical foundation, but I've also traced historically. You know, there, there was the Presbyterians. There, there was a plaque founded a Presbyterian church in Charlotte, North Carolina that described in the early 1800s a six-year outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that church where people literally were stacked up like cordwood. They'd be placed on wagons to be carried home after church. And it said it continued in more or less power for six years. And the disciples of Christ in Kentucky and what became the disciples of Christ. There was, there was such a move of the Spirit of God in, in, the, in the early 1800s, again, in that particular environment. Now, you understand, Kentucky at that point had been settled by people that had been invited by Virginia to leave Virginia. The invitation had a great deal of force behind it. These were people who were convicted murderers, rapists, robbers, and I guess they must have been out of jails in Virginia, so they invited them to move to Kentucky. So if you lived in Kentucky at that time, you knew and understood who your neighbors were. And God sent an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Second Great Awakening in Kentucky caused the president of George Washington College when visiting Kentucky to describe it as the most holy place he had ever been in his life. In the middle. And out of that, I mean, there are stories told of moves of the Spirit where 10,000 or more were slain in the Spirit at one time. One, one, one writer described it said it looked like somebody took batteries of cannon and just shot the people down. And one guy became a leader of the disciples of Christ. Talks about being in a house meeting where, where the people were in his works breaking up. So he decides to put a stop to it. And he starts to put a stop to it and the Spirit of God hits him. And the next thing he knows, he's going through the house preaching the Word of God. And all this incredible stuff is happening. You can trace the history. You understand in the Methodist movement, George Whitfield was once complaining to John Wesley because of people falling down in John Wesley's meetings. You know, and, and, he, and Whitfield thought, we've got to put a stop to this. So Wesley invited Whitfield. They were a classic example, by the way, of people who cannot agree on stuff and be great friends. Because, you know, Wesley was Arminian, Whitfield was Calvinist. I mean, you don't get any more in disagreement than that. You know, and, and they write each other some pretty strong letters historically, but they loved each other. And they're committed. And so Wesley invites Whitfield to come. Whitfield preaches, gives the invitation, and the first four people to the front hit the floor. Wesley says to Whitfield, who's now convinced, I didn't do that, you didn't do that. And Wesley says, now I trust we will let God do God's work God's way. Every one of these moves. You know why they're called the, the Quakers the Quakers? Because they would have meetings where the presence of God would come and they would sit around in the buildings and shake and quake and tremble under the presence of God. That's why they called them the Quakers. I could go on and on and on with the stories of church history. Of God saying, I'm looking for a people where I can presence myself. Somebody said, revival is like God saying, I'm tired of man misrepresenting me. And I would like to come and represent myself. I 
I'm, I'm in the beginnings of a possible relationship with the church in the southern part of the nation. I don't know them. I just know the guy's gone on staff. And, and he tells me this, it's, a, it's a Baptist pastor who got filled with the Holy Spirit and was invited by his church to pastor somewhere else. It happens. And so he, he says to his son, he said, you know, you know, for a couple of years, he just kind of out in the wilderness seeking God. God, I don't understand what's going on. But God begins to stir him. And he says to his son, let's start a church and see what it would look like if the Holy Spirit was in charge. What a remarkable concept. A church that he could actually think he's in charge of. I had somebody said to him one day, I shouldn't tell this, but. I was a new pastor. I was young. I was 24. I didn't know anything. I'd gone to get my hair cut. The lady found out I was pastoring a certain church, and she made reference to a previous pastor who she had really liked, but she didn't like the pastors after that. I went home from that place, and I said to my wife, you've never met Pastor Sonso, but that's what his hair looks like because she tried to cut my hair to look like his Religious activity could continue. You see, in all those churches, the religious activity continues today. All respect. I am, last I checked, in good standing in the assemblies of God. I have no fear of the assemblies of God ceasing to exist as an organization. We are too far down the track to cease to exist. I do have concerns that it is possible for the religious activity to continue while the presence and the intimacy is no longer there. God is not obligated to a name on a door. He's looking for much more than that. And so God says, you're not mine. The relationship is over. I'll scatter you. I'll show no more mercy to you. You see, he had brought them. Now he's scattering them. He had showed the mercy. Now no more mercy. He said, you're my people. And now he said, not mine. Now at this point, if I were to end, we'd all be depressed. So let me try to give us an encouraging word as I do end. This sad story has an amazing turn of events. Hosea 1 and 10. In the same place it was said of them, quote, you are not my people. They will be called, quote, sons of the living God. It speaks to us of the incredible passion and patience of the Lord God. Ultimately, restoration was going to take place. That's what God wanted to do. Let me wrap this up with the incredible promise in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. See if these words have a, a familiar sound from the Old Testament. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Here's the message. We are being given the opportunity to step into the promise that God gave to Moses and God gave to David. We can become that chosen generation, that royal priesthood, that 
holy nation, that peculiar people, a people through whom His praises can be declared. We who are not a people can now become a people. We who have not lived in mercy can now obtain His mercy. Some today are still living what Peter calls spiritual darkness. You're not serving the Lord. And today, he's saying to you, you can have the opportunity to come out of the darkness into that light. The invitation is genuine. The Lord has promised to forgive, to show mercy, to make you his own child. But he waits for you to respond. He provides the opportunity, but he doesn't make the decision. You see, we are committed to the fact that God did give you a free will. And in the giving of that free will, God understands that choice means exactly that. Choice, and there are consequences. If there are no consequences, there was no choice. And God so respects you. He says, I'm going to give you choices, but in that, I will honor the choice you make with whatever the consequence is. So he gives me the invitation to experience his mercy. He gives me the invitation to experience his forgiveness. He says, I, I see you as my treasured possession. I want to come into a unique relationship with you. You'll be mine. And I'll commit myself to being your God. With all that that implies. He said, I'll put my name on the contract I'll sign it in the blood of my son and he pushes it across the table and he says will you sign your name and the choice becomes mine and tonight you can make a choice to sign up if you haven't made that decision in the next moment or so I want you to do that. But then I'm going to give a second invitation because I believe that God is desperately looking for a people. I believe that in every city and town and hamlet, not only in this nation but around the world, God's looking for a people. It's wonderful what the internet makes possible. Forty nations, you said? It's incredible. And I love that. But with all due respect to that, God wants more than that. He wants where you live. Whatever one of those 40 nations you're a part of, He wants there His presence and a people who've committed, God, I'll be yours. He says, and I'll be yours. People who become a holy people with the very presence of God. I don't think I understand that. I don't think you understand that. What does it mean for God to say, I'm going to come and dwell with you? moment I'm going to ask you you make a commitment to say God I want to be that your city is looking for somebody and something that has God genuinely attached to it people say God we'll reach out and God will we'll, we'll be intercessors who will bring their needs to you People with God say, okay, I'm going to come. I'm going to put my presence in your midst. And will you let me make you holy, clean? And I'll put my presence. Will you let him do that? In your life? In your church?